Hello everyone and welcome back. Right after the Bitcoin talk show we had Matt McKibben join us on air to tell us some news about why he chose to resign from BitNation. And since we've had so much coverage of this topic the last few days, we thought we would get Suzanne from BitNation to join us live on air to answer some of the questions that were put to, put to her online in her absence uh, just a couple of hours ago. So welcome Suzanne, thanks for being with us. You have to unmute. There you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I realize that. Yeah, thank you so much, Chris. It's an honor to be here, as always. Uh, that's great. So last night you gave a presentation in London. We live streamed that as well. And I thought it would be more appropriate if we did a dedicated interview with you um, as well, not just because of the, the, the things that Matt was saying, just because I felt like the questions were very contextual to London and people on the Hangout didn't necessarily get to have their questions answered. So there is a Q&A which is working this time. I found out what the bug was and why it wasn't working from the previous episode. So bottom left hand corner of this video, if you have any questions, Dan, please chime in. But the first thing I wanted to start with really was this question of the multi-signature wallet. Now earlier on today in Chris Before Coffee, we had this question of how to recognize fraud when you see it. And one of the conundrums we came up with was why were people assuming or why were they asking questions about the validity of BitNation and also Ethereum? Actually, let's rewind a little bit. The reason we got into this conversation is because we had already been streaming from the Ethereum hackathons and people were trolling us online saying, why are you um, publicizing this scam? And we were like, well, look, we know the people at Ethereum, we've been hanging out with them, they don't feel like scammers to us. So how, how are we misidentifying the scam? And part of the problem was, well, let's take a look at Get Gems, okay? So these people tried to get hold of us and, and wanted to do some publicity on the show. Here's one of the problems, is that all of these websites appear to be the same. They've all got this same sort of layout, right? Where it's like the bootstrap, kind of format and it's kind of scrolly, scrolly, scrolly. You do the pitch, you do the circuit, you do the interviews with Kaiser, you, you know, you do all of that. And people just feel like it's very pumpy and very hypey, particularly when there's not necessarily any delivery. So that's how this all came about. And the question was, how do you identify the difference? And one of the things people wanted to see, they wanted to see transparency. So this is the uh, Bitcoin multi-signature address for Ethereum. It is a multi-sig address. Uh, that has a script set up so that when you purchase the Ether, you can't purchase them anymore, but when you could, every customer was given their own unique address, their own unique Bitcoin address. The funds went to that unique address and then I believe a script was set up that then forwarded it to this multi-signal. I've had a source whilst we've been off air who has confirmed that, that the last part of that is definitely true. They all went through the multi-signature and then we can see them there and we can use the blockchain uh, balance tool in the chart section of their website. You can see the spending and the, and the income on, on that signature. What seems to be different though with the, this is the address from BitNation. There only seems to be one address. It is a standard address beginning with one and not beginning with three so it's not multi-signature. And when Tom was setting up his wallet, he got the same address that I did, and this is the address here, which currently has a balance of 4.2, which hasn't forwarded onto an address beginning with three. So, Suzanne, could you walk us through the, the security process and the, the key holding? Yeah, so essentially it's rather similar to Ethereum because um, we're using a guy called uh, uh, Michael Perkin, who is the guy who's about the same. Um, multi-sig and cold storage system as it did for Ethereum. So the way we went about that was because uh, the time frame was so short. So first we just set up one cold wallet on my computer and then we made the watch only wallets on two different computers. Um, and then what we're doing now is that we're shipping the hardware which takes a couple of days to these two other people. I already have the, the, the hardware. Um, I, have, I have the cold storage hardware. Um, but the two other people, they're still waiting for it to get shipped because, you know, it's international shipping and so forth, so it takes a few days um, to go through. And, um, yeah, so that's basically it, you know. Um, so, I mean, they, they have 
the access to the wallets, I won't say their name on the recommendation of Michael because they will be uh, objects to hacks and so forth. Um, and, but they are two people who are very trusted in the Bitcoin community and who have dealt with uh, multiple SIG wallets and cold storages for many, for well, not many years, but you know, for, for some time. And um, he understands the tech perfectly well. And yeah, so that's about it. So, um, what you say about, you know, that it's not a multiple SIG. Signature is just because the material have not been shipped yet, but they have watch only access of the the cold storage wallet, and they have access to it, and they can and they can work with it. You know, so it is de facto multiple sig. Well, that, so at the moment it sounds like this uh, address beginning with one that all the customers are getting is just a temporary storage, and it sounds like each person involved in the eventual multi sig currently have. Um, a watch-only version of that, but then yeah. eventually when the hardware gets to them, they will all be multi-part holders of a an address beginning with three, which is a multi-signature address, and then eventually the funds in the current address will be forwarded onto that one. Is that is that right? That's correct. Um, and I still need their approval to remove any funds, so it is still a de facto multiple sig address, even though it starts with a one. No, no, because the, there's there's a, a private key that gives you access to to that. So presumably that resides somewhere. Yeah. And you don't have to say who it is, but that is that is by default. If it begins with a one, then there is a private key that corresponds to that, not multiple private keys. Right, but they have uh, watch only wallets right now, mm -hmm. uh, so they can watch every single transactions and they can interfere in their transactions. And I mean, obviously, so far there are no transactions, and so um, that's not even a concern at the moment. Um, no, no, they can't. They can't do anything with a watch-only address. All they can do is watch it. Well, no, that's not actually true, because um, with a watch-only address, um, you can still enable some transfers. So, I mean, it's actually less limited than it sounds. So um, well, you can okay. So so you can what you can do is you can create a transaction, but hmm. it still has to be signed right. by the person exactly. with the private key. Yes, precisely. So so, so what I mean yeah. is there's still a single point of failure with the person yeah, yeah. With that private key. You see. That, that, that's correct. Yes. Because mm. I mean I can publicly take that public key and try to create a transaction with it, hmm. but unless I've got the private key to sign it. There's not a lot I can do. So hmm. what I'm saying, what I'm trying to identify here is, is there a single point of failure and who are we being asked to trust because trust is an awful big part of this. Now when you launched, at the, when you were leading up to the launch, there was no white paper Can you? and there was no code on the GitHub. In fact, there still isn't any original code on the GitHub. Can you see why people might have their doubts given the high level of fraud in the industry up until now? Yeah, but that's why we structured a crowd sale as we have, you know. Structured over a three months period, and um, funds will only be released based on development benchmarks being met. Um, there are six development benchmarks, all of them will be public on GitHub. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I perfectly understand people's concerns, you know, and we have done everything we can to mitigate those concerns. Okay, well, I really want to explore this idea because we've had the same problem on World Crypto Network, right? We, yeah. at the moment, we pu we create our public multi-sig wallets on air, and because of the way the cool way that it that it works, you can actually watch it in Armory being created because all you see are the public keys. That's um, great. Yeah. yeah. Now, at the moment, we hadn't personally, we hadn't really. We had thought about the idea of becoming targets of hacking, and I understand that Michael, the, the, the guy that you've asked to do this for you, is very reputable. I've done my diligence on him, so he seems legitimate. But we didn't have a problem with it, and the reason why is because, well, look, we're public anyway. And fair enough, we haven't raised 18 million, um, and, and that's also a concern. But mm -hmm. it's a bit like, look, there are millionaires in the world already who don't seem to have problems with people coming around and you know, hacking them unless they're in a you know a place, a region of the world where which is known for kidnappings. But in the developed world, they seem to, to enjoy freedom. Celebrities do, and celebrities are on air, and their addresses is usually well known. 
So, yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm just taking the advice from people more experienced mm -hmm. than me. You know, I, mm -hmm. I, I have to say, I just don't know. You know, but I mean, Michael Parkland is the expert in the area, so you know, I take his advice pretty seriously. You know, and but I guess the problem is then, how do we get back to this? A problem of proving your authenticity. If we take as our premise that you're a good person, and believe in this idea, how do we know, for example, that one person doesn't have all the private keys to the multi-sig account, thus undermining the entire thing? Well, I mean, it's all on a public address. Huh? Well, yes, but you see that, that you don't, don't know. On info, you know, blockchain of info. Uh, that's our game. Yes, I know, but that doesn't prove who has the private keys. So, you what what could create what could happen is you could create the illusion of transparency by saying, "Look, it's in a multi-sig address," but one person could have all of the private keys that sign that address. Mm, yeah, I guess that's true. Yeah. So then um, you may as well just not have it. You may as well just have one single address and say, "Okay, I'm not going to tell you who's got it." Well, I think it will be pretty clear. You know, once the free computers are delivered in a couple of days, and it will be a free rather than a one on on mm. the blockchain address. So, you know, I can still not reveal the names of the key holders because mm -hmm. they they have said that they will become targets if I do that. You know, which I think is an accurate assessment actually. And um, but still have a multiple key address. Um, that everybody can watch on the blockchain and see what funds are going in and out. I mean, I'm not sure what more to do, really. You know. Right. Um, well, I I think part uh, of, part of yeah. the problem, I think, it's not, and it's not, it's not your fault at all. I think all that's happened is that it's just rotten timing, really, in terms of the delivery of your project. Because I think you come in in a year of the Gox, the year of the Gox thing earlier this year, that yeah. everyone. Right. On high, high alert for scams. So everyone's senses are going haywire. Then you had Ethereum. They've raised shit tons of money, but they've delivered virtually nothing. And that's one of the reasons why we've been covering their hackathons to kind of shine a light on them. And so far, the people that I have met, you know, Vitalik, Stefan, and some of the other members of the London community seem pretty legitimate people. They seem, in fact, I met a guy called Aaron who even helped me set up my Linux machine for me. He was a really, really kind, kind guy. Like, I can't see why people think that these people are scammers. But given that everyone's on high alert, we do need to work out. And I think part of the reason, I'm seeing if I can find a tweet by my mate, GCG. He's also a fan of yours, by the way. And one of the things that he brought up earlier on was that you guys were only asking for 10% seed round initially. Is that yeah, right? That's and how, right. Much, how much is the 10% seed round? Um, well, that's sort of um, speculatory, right? So... I mean, what we would need to run this, you know, the entire dev operation, without having sort of like um, stressful moments and mental concerns and whatnot, um, uh, would be about two million dollars. However, if we get like one million dollars or even five hundred thousand, we'll still be able to run the operation, but we would just be under a lot more stress mm -hmm. and a lot more financial constraints. So. Uh, so, so essentially, it's just a matter of like, you know, if if we're gonna go do this with a peace of mind, or if we're gonna do this without a peace of mind. Okay. Yeah. So actually, the two million is the seed round. Right. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. I think, but, I think but, part of what, what would help this a lot is if the the if the funding had been first of all, obviously, the organisation. I think if you could have done things differently. Would you say, what would you have done? Uh, let me ask you the question. What would you have done differently knowing what you know now? Um, wow, that's a hard question. Um, that's such a broad question. Uh, like yeah. Um, no, she's cool. She's the innovator. So, I mean, essentially, one of the things. Um, You know, I, I was just having a talk with um, Rick Falkbringer, who started the Pirate Party earlier today. You know, and I told him about some of my problems with like public sandring and, and whatnot. And he told me he had the exact same problem with the Pirate Party. When he started the Pirate Party, about four months afterwards, after he started it, 
he had a lot of people slandering him in public and telling him to quit and whatnot and he just said like well we we covered this in the book you know and you know at some point when you start to get initial attention you will attract people who are there for their own purpose rather than the sort of overall organizational goals right and um and you can't uh, you know you, you cannot not accept them in because of the open nature of the project and so you have to accept them in and then they will just flash out by themselves and so I guess my biggest concern at this point is that I did not do enough due diligence on some people and I trusted some people who were not trustworthy and that's about it, yeah. And it's a road bump to get through and it's annoying and painful but I mean, hey, you know, I spent five years in war zones, like it's nothing that's I've been death threatened by Taliban. So I had staff kidnapped by Libyan militias. I mean, this is sort of, I think, compares on a very small road bump. Um, so it's something I won't get through, you know. But it's it's been draining. Um, I show. I really would like to go into that just before we segue, though, so we don't get off on a tangent. Um, yeah. I personally would have. What I can say to you is that you you're definitely um, someone of conviction, someone who believes in herself and, and your vision too, I think. And what I think would help is if you staggered the, the fundraiser a bit more and just offered something, anything. Like on this network, we just started making shows. And obviously that's easy because the YouTube channel doesn't involve any code. But if you could do something to, to, win, to win over some kind of good faith, like a hackathon or something, um, you know, I can help if it's in London. I can, I can, you know, point you in the right direction and help you get a venue or something. Just so that you can build a rapport with people face to face, that probably would go a long way to helping the funds come in. Because what we're having to do on the on the network, and of course, it's easy for us because they're just YouTube shows. But we're sort of doing this in stages, like two thousand pounds for a camera and a microphone and some setup. You know, more money for this and that, and actually, really, really kind of chunk it down like that so that we're actually being forced to you know work for it you know I mean the thing is I'm a little bit overwhelmed at the moment because there's just so much media requests to respond to uh, like uh, I mean I have like about five different Q&A's every day you know and, and hangouts and whatnot and you know um, there was the tech side or the financial side or it's like the media side, I mean, it's just a lot going on right now, you know, and I, my time is very limited and the team's time is very limited, you know, so we're trying to cope with it the best we can, you know, but, but we're under a lot of pressure from many different directions, right? I mean, what I want to do before anything is to make sure a uh, counter wallet doesn't have a problem and properly communicates um, with with XPNX, you know, and and that alone is not an easy challenge, you know. So, um, can the wallet have a lot of problems, you know? And so, I mean, I'm spending most of my time actually with that, just trying to figure out like basic dev problems. And so, but yeah, I mean, I agree with you. I mean, having like a proof of a minimal viable product, the MVP, is definitely key. So. If I would do a hackathon, what I would really like, so um, I don't know if you have looked into Breach CC. No, say again. A Breach CC. Okay, I'll look at it. Yeah, so uh, Breach CC is the platform that we're building everything on. And it's a very modular platform. It's built on uh, Node.js and Java and Chrome, essentially. Yeah, that's the thing, exactly. So, um, I mean, if I would have a hackathon, I would like uh, the hackathon to be about Breach CC, you know, and people like the modules into Breach CC and playing around with it and testing the system. That would be the most constructive thing, I think. I don't know what you think. Well, that's great. So this is this is great. This is progress. Yeah, I could see that working really well. I think one of the reasons why someone's just um, shouted me out in a private message. Um, 
do, does Suzanne deserve all this um, attention just because we've given you so much airtime? I think the reason the answer is yes is because you've presented us with an idea that a lot of people have been having, that this has come to a lot of us, and, but you've just expressed it in a way that feels very personal to you. And it's something that you want to exist. You want to bring this into the world. There's a little bit of politics in what you say, but not that much. Like some of that did come across in the TED Talk, but mostly it's like, I want to be free. And you're just expressing yourself. And that's why I kind of have given it so much airtime. Um, because I think there is something deeper here. There's something going on here. I think the problem I have, well, not the problem, but the, one of the features of Vitalik is that he's very, very technical and he's very cold. And he just, I love it the way he thinks. Um, and more people should think the way he does and make more of an effort to understand him. Um, but he thinks very rigidly and very scientifically. But then you've come along and you've put a personal angle on this. You've given this, uh, you know, uh, you've made it relevant to people. You've helped people to understand, like, why this is important, why they should care. No, Vitalik is cute. Maybe because he has a Russian name. <laughs> He's a Russian. Hey, I think hey, hey just quickly, sorry. Yeah. Uh, big, big, big respect, Suzanne, for uh, coming on and explaining. And you know, it's no easy task building something up from the ground up. Um, so you know, I think that uh, a lot of the things Chris covered was just genuine kind of business um, watertight questions. You know, if you're asking for money and asking for investment. You know, people want to see a kind of real war type proposition all the way down to the end. So I think that the idea isn't dead. I think the project isn't dead. And I think the fact that you're on here talking about it is a great start. Oh, she can't currently hear you because she's actually exited the call, but of course she'll be able to watch this back she again. She ain't crying, is she? God, <laughs> bring her back. Oh, Suzanne, we love you, man. <laughs> no, this is the problem. This is the problem. When we put ourselves in the public environment and when we put ourselves in projects that we're absolutely passionate about, it's very, very difficult. Could you imagine programmers when they're all sitting around development teams? You know, uh, you guys are the coders, and I could imagine the headaches that go around developing stuff and launching products. So, you know, uh, um, yeah. Yeah, actually, we discussed it uh, today uh, the fact that um, loads of things go through this um, scam rite of passage mm -hmm. as a normal procedure, almost like a tradition I suppose I, I remember reading so much stuff about like ether being scam like every coin goes through this com scam coin uh, stage every project related to it as well yeah I think it's a self defense, me that's a self defense mechanism that you know before whenever anyone says I, I want to sell you something or proposes that the first reaction that most people have is no I don't want it not it's fine. Uh, in, there is a benefit of doubt in the legal systems when someone who's not proven guilty is not guilty. But in sort of this community, is completely the other way around. It's a bit wild. That's yeah, cool. that's true. Yeah. I mean, it has advantages and disadvantages. Well, it looks like Suzanne isn't isn't able to connect. I'm just her now. But one of the things I think that's unfortunate about Ethereum is that it wasn't just the trolls on the internet. Like they would it was proper. Like it was heating up and it was getting very personal. And I you know, I, I can't really say too much at this stage, but yeah, I you know, it was it was more than just trolling on the internet, put it that way. It was it was merging into the offline space and it was, you know, it's worried it's worried some people. So um I think that we do have to be careful about how we... I think the best way to do it is on YouTube, in a physical air gaps environment. I think dialogue, not violence. Dialogue is a very good point, yeah, because, I mean, it's so easy. I mean, all these projects, maybe they, they raise a lot of money, but at the same time, it's extremely vulnerable space, and you, by sort of bullying too much, you can completely kind of stop innovation, if you like. Mm, and we don't want that. We want people to still come up with great ideas. We want people to come up with, you know, decentralized platforms or things that innovate. And I certainly, you know, we don't want to make people feel bad. And, you know, uh, it, it, in the spirit of innovation, you know, I think it's, it's only the right thing. Hi, guys. Oh, she's back. Stop talking about her. It's okay. <laughs> I'm only joking. I'm only joking. Hey guys, I'm so sorry. I'm staying at a hotel in London at the moment, and I have to renew maintenance subscription. Hey, it's all right, baby. Don't worry. <laughs> it expires every 24 hours, so you know it's just. 
That's cool. That's That's cool. About the disruption. Yeah, so we we were just talking about like well, first of all, before you left, Shem was you know saying it was great that you were on here and you were answering these questions, and I think that it has gone a long way. Um, you know, because I think a lot of people would have given up having you know gone through what you went through on uh, Monday. Um, so kudos to you for for keeping. Yeah, on kudos. Really. And this is this is part of the development process, isn't it? You know that that isn't it so much cooler when someone comes back and goes, do you know what that original idea? I've still stuck to it, and this time we've done it, and this is what it looks like. Da da. Yeah. That that was the noise of me pulling a rabbit out of a hat. Yeah, very good. <laughs> well, I've been talking about this for ten years. I'm not gonna abandon the idea because of four blog posts. You know. Right. That's ridiculous. <laughs> How, how much funding have you guys got so far? Um, well, let me check the, the blockchain address. Not very much. It's just a couple of bitcoins. It's about four point two bitcoins. Yeah, which I'm not very concerned about, you know, because the crops oh, is out for three months, and um, so. and it's based on development benchmarks. So every time a new code comes out, you know, that's obviously going to boost it. So. Yeah, I'm not at all concerned about level right now. Okay. Well, I'd love to hear because you, you so you mentioned that you've been talking about this idea for 10 years and one of the things I don't know if it's been explored elsewhere, it didn't strike me that it had in the sort of research that I've done. Can you tell us a little bit more about your background because it sounds like you have a very worldly and um, it sounds to me like you're a citizen of the universe, right? Like you just exist, <laughs> where you, are. you belong to wherever you are. But you've got all these stories that you allude to, but then you move on very quickly about Afghanistan and Libya. Could you, could you tell us a little bit more about that? Um, yeah, I mean that's a very broad, vast subject, you know. Um, I mean, essentially, I grew up in Sweden. Um, I was born in Sweden. My father is was a Polish political refugee. He was stateless for nearly a decade, and my mother is from France. And um, they met in UK, and then they decided to move to Sweden because socialism and whatnot, you know. <laughs> and um, so I grew up in this very political environment in Sweden, and um, I was always sort of. I mean, Sweden is a very sort of homogeneous society, and. Um, I never quite fit into that society, and I was, and like my brother was not a Swedish citizen because my father was a refugee, right? And neither was my mother, you know. And so I was the only Swedish citizen in the family, actually. And I found it very weird to that, you know. I mean, I was the least Swedish person in the family somehow, but still, I I had to like I I had privileges they didn't have, you know. And I found that very weird, and I started to think about the nation state from a very sort of early stage in life, you know, and what the problem was. Why, why just because we're randomly born somewhere in some city, you know, we have to oblige to the same laws and whatever. And and then I wasn't particularly left wing or right wing or anything, but um, I just thought, you know, the the nation state. Uh, system was wrong, you know, that, that we were geographical prisoners, essentially, and that there was no competition and no, like, individual choice, no fair choice, and, but I still thought for a very long time the best uh, way to solve it was to work within the system, right, so, um, and so I looked ar across the world, and this was not far after 9-11, you know, and I thought, well, who are the biggest bully on the block, you know, and that was obviously the US government. So I went to Afghanistan and I started working as a defense contractor for the US military. And um, I did that for um, about one year, you know. I, I did, I came there, I was 22 years old. I came as a graphic designer at the time. And uh, that was my background, right? And and I was a media graphic design person, and I came there. I started to do like all the sort of Osama bin Laden wanted poster that was like bombed out over the Afghan Pakistani border. And then after a year, I quit and, and I started my own company, was Strategic Communication. And within two years, we made millions of dollars. 
and we, we, we switched from doing communication to doing research and data collection and we set up a network of hundreds of people in every province in Afghanistan and, um, and then I sold the company to a US consulting company, IDS International and by that time I was sort of, I was, uh, by the time I sold it I was 26 years old and I had spent already four years in war at that point and seen quite a lot of stuff, you know, and I started to get slowly very cynical and more and more libertarian and over time anarchist and um, and then so I decided to retire for some time and just work on writing and just um, talk about like sort of post nation state solutions and then when I did that, you know, in the same moment, the Libyan revolution started, the Arab Spring started, and I was really hating Gaddafi, and I really wanted to help the Libyan rebels out, so, um, yeah, within like 24 hours, I flew to Cairo, and I drove for eight hours for the desert to join the Libyan rebel headquarters in, in Benghazi, and I stayed there throughout the entire civil war, Pretty much, and um, so true. Like, did have his overfall and everything. And and while I was there, you know, I was still a government contractor at that point. And uh, I started another company called Chabacat. And I was still a government contractor. And uh, at that point, for State Department. And um, I I don't know. I was just sort of trying to stay convinced that it was the right way to go. <laughs> But the more I saw from the inside and the more dysfunctional things I, I realized was going on and how corrupt the entire system was and and at the same time I was living in the rebel territories and it was anarchy, de facto anarchy because because I mean there was a government, rebel government, the um, but they were like ten guys hiding out in, in a basement moving that basement every day because they were afraid of being targeted and their only role was to speak to international media so it was de facto no government, right? So even though they were called the transitional government but they, they really were not and and what shocked me was that actually anarchy worked so well like there were people doing neighborhood vigilantes, they were keeping out like engineers were working day and night to give up the communication system. Yeah, I know, I know, but there's a there's a big difference between anarchy and you know, fun, you know, the the Libya thing is a massive topic in itself, Suzanne, and I, I, I obviously that's fantastic you was involved in that and stuff, but there's a lot of things that Gaddafi was doing with the gold Dina and stuff, you know, and I, I, I was I was against Gaddafi, but then yeah. when you look at some of the things that Gaddafi was trying to do against American imperialism, then it's quite clear, you know, so. I, I mean, you know, look at Libya now. You know, it's run by, well, we've got ISIS heading in there if ISIS ain't there already, you know, so. Well, I don't think ISIS is in Libya. I mean, that's So the point. question is of sustainable anarchy. So sustainable anarchy, Ksenia is saying, who, by the way, is also well, in Sweden at the moment. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, my, my point was just, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you, you know, my point was just that. I saw anarchy in practice. You know, I don't, I don't endorse American imperialism. I have quit everything that had to do with anything related to U.S. government, and I'm doing the radical opposite, and I'm a radical anarchist. Um, but my point was that I saw anarchy in action, and then when Bitcoin, Bitcoin came along, in I saw that it actually worked better to do stuff outside of the system rather than within the system. And that's when I decided to abandon all government work and just go hardcore crypto and try to do everything through the blockchain. So, yes. so, you're, so you're not involved in any government contract work right now? Absolutely not, no. I, I quit more than two years ago and I will never go back in. And I regret a lot of the church? <laughs> Have you cut the grass yet in that place? <laughs> what? Oh, yes. right, yeah. <laughs> That's funny, you would ask that, yeah. <laughs> um, oh, good on you, man. I wish I could buy a church on the internet. Did you guys know that? She bought a church on the internet. Isn't that cool, man? 
<laughs> can I, can I ask how how did you end up in Brazil? Because you've also talked a lot about how you're sort of six months of the year you're in Brazil, and you mm. talk a lot about the slums there. So, mm. how did you end up there? Uh, well, by deduction, essentially. I mean, when I came out of Afghanistan, I had a little bit of money on me, and I wanted to buy a house by the sea, and I just took out a world map and tried to figure out where it was always hot all year around, relatively cheap with real estate and good protection for uh, international uh, people, I mean, non-citizens, and, um, and yeah, and no sort of major risk for earthquakes or volcanoes or whatnot, right? And, um, and no sort of political unrest. So, yeah, I mean, basically by deduction, Brazil sort of stood out as the more, most reasonable option. Now, sustainable anarchy. So, Ksenia, do you want to say a little bit more about that? So you're also a citizen of the universe. Uh, no, it was just a brief comment. I, ju I just sort of, I know the feeling when um, I'm quite skeptical about things and I see very beautiful things happening. Um, it's a bit like a, oh, it's a long discussion of like temporary autonomous zone or pe uh, permanent autonomous zone, zone, and sometimes there is a dynamic when everything just structures in a really good way and decentralized way, and then things go up shit creek. So all this um, technology is probably assisting the 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 right kind of sustainable way because I mean. I always end up talking about it, like um, when you think of Occupy or, for instance, um, uprisings in um, in the uh, Middle East as well. It's very good dynamic, and it ends up really sad. And I'm myself. I grew up in the 90s in uh, Russia, so there was this kind of re really kind of period of hope and democracy or whatever, and then it just goes up shit creek again. So. That's why I mentioned like sustainable anarchy because I'm not an anarchist myself, but I'm kind of I'm really inspired with these ideas and kind of grew up with it, and I just don't see it working in in its kind of original sense. Even in like an anarcho positive but positivist positivist sense either, uh, I just haven't seen it working for a long time. If you like. Uh, yeah. It's well, I mean, you know, I like to differentiate between governance 1A and governance TA. So governance 1A being essentially the, the unhappy marriage between politics and territory, right? So I think anarchy can work yeah, and will work in a non-territorial type of sense. If people are not fighting for land, uh, and everybody can just choose their own government provider, much like people now choose their own like, um, social media provider. You know, you can choose if you want to be on Facebook or LinkedIn or MySpace or whatever, because all of them are allowed, right? And the only conflict between them is who provides the best service, and that's how you acquire customers, right? It's not about if you, by force, control any particular territory, or, um, so I think, you know, now we have technological means, you know, between globalization of large, from transport to, you know, a growing middle class all over the world uh, who are educated and aware and want more choice, etc., to the technology and internet and so forth. And I think we now have, for the first time in history, maybe the opportunity to create that solution. What did you just say, Kasani? I said they also want more cars, unfortunately. In, in the family, bigger cars. Self-driving big cars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, I don't. Uh, I just mentioned when uh, when you dropped out, Suzanne, that it's kind of um, easy to be skeptical. Uh, and yeah, I try not to be. It's just like, basically, I'm skeptical and kind of romantic about the same things as well. I'm skeptical about skepticalism. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but I mean, I just, yeah. 
I mean, you know, I mean, to people are saying that, you know, about that nation that oh, it's a humongous, very ambitious project. Thanks. It's, it's a hugely ambitious, but don't we just love ambitious projects? But this is the thing: if you can get it watertight, Suzanne, you know, and pull this off. You know, it's a good thing. I, I think Theo yeah. mentioned a couple of things that are quite similar. It might be worth, you know, when I started doing a PhD years ago, I wasn't ready. I didn't fucking do any of the homework, you know, and uh, <laughs> it didn't happen. It's just what happens. You know, you have to do, I remember my lecturer saying, dude, you can't rock up here saying this, that, and the other, and you haven't done nothing. <laughs> like, ah. So but what's I think about, you've got uh, something. Yeah. So, sorry, yeah, so, yeah, and I think, you know, I mean, First of all, just getting the message out there to people saying, you know, things does not have to be the way it is. Just because you are born in Afghanistan and you have a shit passport, it doesn't mean your entire life has to be lived like this. There are actually other alternatives, you know, and they are reachable and functionable. And, you know, just to get that message out to the world in itself is a huge thing. You know, and when people say like, "Oh, I mean, it's a huge, ambitious project," and I mean, my only answer to that is like, "Yeah, maybe it will take fifty years to push through to to make all the changes realistic." You know, it will definitely take a decade to get critical mass adoption, and and whatnot. But that doesn't matter because this is the new world, right? So this is what we want. This is a voluntary system. Mm, yeah, this is the new world, and it, this is. I think you're right. I think there's. I think there's growing, growing consensus of people that want to change the world and and look at the old systems, the old empires, and they want to progress. You know, and when we look at the, yeah. the shared, the shared differences, the shared, you know, humanity. You know, it's a huge problem. All the artists, all the scientists, all the musicians throughout history have been trying to crack this problem. You know, why is humanity not peaceful? The best I could do is break it down to eight things. You know, oil, my, uh, energy, money, you know, a sense of spirituality, you know, and a couple of other things that relate to us as individual humans and the geopolitics. So, so I really felt, uh, one of, you know, I think one of the reasons you got so much attention with this project is because it it kind of it's looking at one of the major problems, which is uh, you know globalization, geography, nation state, and governance, which are things that haven't really changed much over the past 500 years. And Suzanne, as someone that's been involved with government projects and stuff like that, you've obviously you know got to grasp with how it works and become disenchanted with it, as everyone does in all kinds of industries when we realise how the way the world works and we think, well, do you know what? That's old and doesn't work. How can we innovate? How can we change it? How can we make the world a better place? And I think that's a really great moral compass to have in the right direction. And so, uh, fantastic for you coming on today and 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 answering. The questions, you know, they're, they're never easy questions because people want to know the nitty gritty, and you know, sometimes the nitty gritty cannot be answered short, you know. But uh, I hope, I hope it's inspiring. I, I it always makes me learn, you know, with with our projects. You say, how do we make the world better? You know, it sounds like us trying to make our second album. You know? <laughs> 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 We're fucking making up as we go along. No. I just want to address a point that you made there, Shem, which is that this this idea that we've got a lot of violence in the world has actually not been proven to be true. Stephen Pinker talks about this. Um, he's, he's a great uh, academic and a great thinker. He's a linguist by trade. And that's because just as, uh, justice as a human institution is a fractal phenomena. That means it transcends our ability to understand delineated borders. So it's not something that just is, it's something that you recognize in the world. And because it takes place intergenerationally, because it takes many thousands of years to recognize, it's impossible for us to get the whole picture and the whole perspective. So actually, the level of violence in the world is now going down, but the, the amount of religious violence is going up as a proportion. The reason why it feels to us like there's more violence in the world, Pinker claims, is because we have more communication now. We've got the big picture. We can see everything live on air. And so we witness the injustice, and then it, it feels wrong to us. And this is why earlier on in our video with James in Hong Kong, when he had the police right in front of him and he was screaming, and you could hear the, the passionate voice, he ended up actually hurting himself. He had to go to hospital again. Um, and he, he got hit. Oh, yeah, like he's, he was whacked with a baton the other day. He was unconscious for 10 minutes. 
and then today he was live streaming for us at the front line with these police and he took a knock and we kind of obviously we could see what was going on like we could see it was a big promotion he didn't notice at the time now one of the things that these live streams have done with James is it's made it very present we feel like we are there with them now it doesn't feel like they're over there like you know the problem with trading and speculating and all these, they're just playing computer games, these traders. Like you could sneak into Canary Wharf overnight, switch, fill, hack the software so that actually when they come back the next day they're playing with plain money and then we can all fuck off, let them keep trading in their big trading rooms and then we can really discover the price of oil and the price of fish and the price of milk or whatever, right? Let them keep playing their games, yeah, get the numbers higher, get the numbers higher. And they can carry on playing it, but it, they may as well be playing World of Warcraft because they're making decisions in a fucking glass air-conditioned building. What the hell do they know about the real cost of, of fishing in Hong Kong? What the hell do they know? They're not the ones taking the risks every day. So all this idea about efficient market hypothesis is bullshit because it operates on the assumption that information travels freely over the world. It doesn't. Profit emerges when one group of people has privileged access to information another group depend on. And that's why they are able to eke out profit. They then inflate the money supply, quickly put it into essential commodities like land and oil, and then dump the rest of the money on us, effectively well, depending on our income. But that's exactly why we have to remove uh, nation state uh, on the company. And yeah, and I, I don't disagree. So to, to, to move this forward, an idea we had off air between the last show and this one was I was said, why don't we get started with, with the BitNation? We'll do a World Crypto Network BitNation meetup where we invite people along, we get them to create PGP keys in front of us, and then live on air, we, that would be fantastic. we live on air, we give them a BitNation, World Crypto, we'll call it what you like, but a passport, right? A universal. Yeah passport because now what happens is let's say the problem with um, PGP yeah, but the, the problem with uh, sorry to interrupt you can I just say the, the last thing because there is a problem with PGP which is you don't get forward secrecy so if yeah. someone steals your key you're fucked they can then masquerade as you they can start signing messages as you so one of the things I suggested was well maybe what you do is you have a, um, um, a periodic what's called a challenge response so every month or every period of time you have to come back to the venue and re-stamp your key and then you leave and then you leave. Now the way what, I what, see what this... By the venue? So you have to turn up at a, at a location. There still has to be an international group that goes around being this passport service, right? That physical location. Mm, so you re-verify yourself all the time. Yeah. You're re-verifying within a trust network. So people trust me because I'm on the YouTube channel. So I'm here and I've got a personality and I've You're got a key. You're really trust you, isn't it? Well, over time, sure. Why not? I'm joking. I'm well, just teasing you. I mean, the problem is I've been looking a lot into ID systems, obviously. Um, and the problem is so there are two strands of the ID system. One of them is uh, verification and the other one is reputation. And in terms of I mean, verification is really the hardest part, you know. A reputation is quite straightforward and intuitive. But verification, so you can either use a government ID as a verification strand, which is obviously against our ideals, you know, because we don't believe in that. Or you can use, like, biometrics, which is very challenging, and the technology isn't quite there for it yet. So, um, I mean, there are very many ways you can set this up. but None of them are optimal at this point. Um, so, I mean, creating an ID system is one of our really, like, first challenges. But if it's, I mean, we can create an ID system today. We can set up a MongoDB database, you know, and smash up a database and just say, okay, well, register here and give us your private keys. And we'll say, this is your bit passport. But that doesn't really mean anything, actually, right? Uh, it doesn't really mean it, anything if you don't have the other futures added to it. Mm, that, that is my problem right now. But remember that t technology is a sense. It's a way that binds our biological needs with the matter of the universe. That's what it's proved itself to be again and again over time. What and do you mean by that? So you have to, at some point, the software touches the hardware, and the hardware eventually touches the biology, eventually. 
it will get through to your retina if it's a screen that you're looking at, if you're touching something, if it's haptic, you get some haptic feedback, tactile feedback. Eventually, it is about satisfying the desires, right? Okay, so, so what you're that saying that is that... I'm so sorry to interrupt you again. So just to clarify, so what you're saying is an initial like MongoDB database uh, accomp accompanied by like a public key signature would No, not you're thing. getting too technical too quickly. It's human yes. powered, I think, Chris. Do you mean that it's kind of human powered? You've got to work out the wetware first and then get into the right. into the software before you get to the software. Think about the social thing. So here's one way that I thought of that the biological thing could work. You take an ECT signature and you generate a seed that can generate other private keys. That is asymmetric one way top down. So like a hierarchical deterministic wallet. So it would just keep creating keys and you would be able to trace it back. And what I could do is I could go to one of these meetups, meet my best friend Harry, right? Who we've known each other for years. We've done things together, we've been together in places in which only you, her and I would know about that. So she can vouch my authenticity simply because we have a shared memories together, right? She can sign my top level key and that key can then go about and create other keys. Now <coughs> I'm going to have to check in to a physical location to be witnessed with the, in the meet space um, in with this with this uh, you know passport service, and that's going to have to be witnessed, recorded, and then uploaded to the blockchain. That's the only way I could see it fused. Because if you leave it entirely to the biology, the problem is you're giving someone an incentive to knock you out so that they can grab your your private key. In order for me to generate these child identities, mm. be able to turn up to a location at a specific time with someone who can vouch for me on air where it's like stamped into the blockchain because I don't know if you've been following us but I've created this um, blockchain investigation system by on, on air what I'll do is I'll read out the latest block height um, yeah. on the blockchain. But let's, let's do it right now actually, let's do it right now so that everyone can see yeah, what's showing yeah. I mean, one okay. of uh, the works I've been looking into, which I'm quite impressed by, um, is uh, Vlad Zamfer. He's been working a lot on both social and uh, social reputation systems. Um, Vlad Zamfer is sort of, a, I guess, junior referee in Devon, um, but, but a very, very clever one. And I respect his work a lot. Um, so what he's been saying, essentially, is his main point is that if reputation have any value, we have to assume that it will be bought and sold. Um, and that's that's sort of the main concern with civil attacks, right? It's not so much that people will try to hack it, it's that people will buy it and sell it, right? And, and so the way to counter um, that particular problem is to have a high barrier of entry based on essentially entry cost, which is counterintuitive for a sort of open source world. But but that's sort of um, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> what have seen like the most sort of straightforward rational uh, argument I've seen so far. Yeah, well, let, let's let's look at how this works. So what I'll do is I go to blockchain.info and I can do this on video. I can do it on on audio too. Block height three hundred twenty-five thousand four hundred ninety-eight. Merkle root beginning C seven A seven B F A A. Now what I've just done there is as soon as this uh, show finishes, I will produce a SHA two five six hash digest of this video's content. I will upload that to the blockchain, and what that proves is that this video existed between the block height that we're currently on and the block height that I eventually stamp it into, thus negating any incentive for me to lie about the actual time that it, that it you, I mean, you could already do that easily through BlockSign. They provide exactly that service, you know, and BlockSign is already live and functioning. I have signed contracts with BlockSign before. No, what, what BlockSign does, I, I use a, a site similar to BlockSign. And what that does is it proves that it existed at that time or any time prior. So I could timestamp the works of Shakespeare and say, look, I did. Right, exactly, yeah. 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 But with this system, because you're putting in the Merkle root of the current block height, it proves that it took place at this time or later. And then when it eventually goes into the blockchain, it 
proves that it took place at this time or prior, thus giving you an interval of time. At the moment, the best way to commit fraud is never lie. Right? You just take stuff that really did happen in the past, you reorder it into a new sequence, and then you play a theater. You give everyone a production like the banking system does. We're in a hologram right now. And so they put you inside of their virtual reality, because really all a virtual reality is is a system with less information than the, the parent system. right? And so then you can create a world where you've got more information than the people who require the information, and then you can make them your, your slaves. They can't price their labor effectively. They don't know what their time is worth anymore because you're controlling the whole world. Now, if you could create this type of time stamping and you could include, like you say, like a, a reputation system, I like what you say about being bought and sold, then what you're doing is you're giving people the ability to create a plurality of identities if they want to because we we need anonymity if we don't have anonymity we can't exactly. be authentic you know we can't yes. be, we can't we're always going to be burdened by what society has told us we are yeah. I mean people always say falsely that the blockchain provides anonymity but actually it doesn't it provides a tremendous amount of exposure you know we'll really have to work very hard as a group together to make it more anonymous now have you met Amir Taki no, I have not met him. I have not been. Um, I have uh, close friends and colleagues who are in constant touch with him, but I have never personally met him or spoken. Mm, you him. should meet him. He, I believe, he's yeah. in London. He's around London at the moment. I've been hanging out with him at the Bitcoin Squat, um, which also is a, is an anarchist. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. BBC covered it quite well. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Did you see that we actually did the expose and we actually revealed the whole interview of Peter? Yeah, I, I mean, I just read an interview in like Bitcoin magazine uh, the other day with Amir Taiki, and I have to say, like, one the sort of whole like um, dark wallet things came at first. I was a little bit skeptical. I was like, why don't you know as many people on Reddit proposed they were like, why don't we call it this sort of pink unicorn type of wallet type of thing? And I, I sort of agreed with that stance, actually. Like, why would you want to bring unnecessary attention to what you do, right? But, um, but the more I sort of read on um, Amartaki's stance on things, the more it made sense to me, you know. And um, so, actually, now I'm I'm becoming more and more sort of friendly towards the whole idea, and especially after reading the last article in Bitcoin magazine, um, I'm very friendly to it, actually. So this this is dark wallet, and it's very very clever the way it works. It runs on something called Bitcoin SX, which I think was first done by um, well, it was first proposed by Bitcoin originally, and then Peter Todd, chief scientist of everything, um, went to the Bitcoin mailing list and said, "Look, guys, you know this 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 technology which essentially puts um, Bitcoin on a par with regular banking, where people can't see what's in your address." Now the way it works very basically is this stealth address here is two. Bitcoin public keys concatenated, just joined together, and every time someone sends you a donation to, to that address using the, the stealth code, um, it will generate a new output for it to go to, sorry, a new input address to go to, so like I've got here, right? So it'll just send it to a new address, new address, new address. So as the way it looks to the outside, it's like nothing's going to this address. But actually, there are new addresses being made, but you don't know that they're owned by the same stealth. That's all it does. So it's effectively like you generating a new address for each person. At the moment, you have to share a secret in order for that to work. You've got to tell the other person what your address is. They then know that they've sent you that money, and that can get very embarrassing. So it's a trust network, essentially. Say again? It's a trust network, essentially. Yeah. And that, that's essentially, that's how it works. And then when you spend them, you've got to be careful because if you spend them all at the same time, you end up revealing yourself just by the fact you sent them all in one transaction. So the way they get around that is that you send them in a staggered way over time from each address individually and then it goes through coin join as well for extra. Um, mm. yeah. yeah, I can see that. I, I mean, I, I'm becoming more and more pro of the whole idea. And I, I, I think it's fantastic and I want to be part of it. Yeah, so we've got all of these tools, and I think what what I all I am feeling like is there's too much marketing and not enough doing. Like we need to just absolutely, and baby, I work in marketing. 
There's nothing wrong with community. There's nothing wrong with leadership. There's nothing wrong with being passionate and activist. That's a better word. Being an activist and inspiring other people to do it. But at the moment, I just feel like with all these pre-sales, crowd sales, I just feel like we've got to move on. Like we can't just keep asking for money. Like the way that the that the guys work at Dark Wallet is they literally live out of dumpsters. They live in squats. They live out of dumpster food. Like. Yeah. You know, so they're making real sacrifices, and we were saying also Kyle Drake, who who made um, Coin Punk, right? Like this guy just didn't, doesn't get any love, man. Like this guy is a really mm. cool project, he is cool. But, but because he can't make a sexy video, he doesn't get the funding, you know? Yeah, but but I mean, one of the problems right now in the crypto sphere, as I see it, is that there are, um, for lack of better words. Too many ideas and not enough dev soon. Like every single project is desperate for devs, you know. Um, I mean, sure, you can get Ukrainians on Odesks, you mm. know, but that only goes so far, right? So, so what's know. your what's your plans? For, um, I mean, those developers uh, um, who have left, are you putting together a new development team? Uh, you, you know, what's your what, what's your kind of next step after tomorrow? Do you think? Um, well, first of all, I mean, the article that came out saying that the core dev team left was completely wrong because none of them were actually part of the dev team to start with, and none of them were devs, <laughs> and none of them were particularly core either. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, I mean, that, that was sort of a uh, basis lies, essentially. Um, and I mean, the other part that they said on those articles was that they quit because of the lack of incorporation, which I also find very strange because one of the things we are promoting indeed is incorporation on the blockchain and that we can do all the things without the government. So that they left because of that is also sort of non logical, but okay. Um, and anyway, so. Um, so you know, we do have devs left. We do have, um, we do have financial people left. We do have a lot of people left. Uh, that the, uh, you know, the sort of allegations that the core team resigned is just not true. And um, we do need to hire more people, though. Uh, we do need to hire more devs, although we do have devs. We do need to hire more media people, although we still have media people. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's just, it's like every startup, right? It's just something you have to get through. You flesh out the bad elements and you keep the people who are more concerned about the goal and the overall vision rather than their own self-promotion and that's about it. So, so who are the devs at the moment? Do you have, can you give us any names of people? Uh, well, considering like how much uh, former employees are trying to destroy the business right now. I'd rather not be public with it because I know they will contact them instantly and try to destroy the business. Um, I mean, so the guy, uh, again, I won't mention any names, but the guy who kicked the slander off and um, shut down the YouTube channel, he tried to destroy the server, and he messaged every single person on the team, you know, uh, trying to get them to quit. Etc. Etc. I mean, it was really quite bad, and um, so well. What I can say is, one person is a very well-respected person in the Bitcoin community. He is a uh, very high level, you know, when it comes uh, to knowledge in Python and JavaScript and Node.js, etc. Um, and the other person uh, is, is uh, not so well known in the crypto community, but he is someone I know for several years and I'm working with on other projects and someone I trust. So, um, so yeah, let, let, let me just say that for the moment because, I mean, I already had so much disruption as of now and I don't want to cause further disruption through insane employees, former employees who clearly need to get some professional help, you know, at some point. Well, I'm glad that we got to clear that up, and actually I'm, I'm quite happy, um, 
you know, with the way this conversation, this dialogue has gone. Um, I, you know, mm. here are the people you can read it for yourself. Mm. Um, and big respect, think, Suzanne, for coming in. Good yeah. respect for you coming in and, and you know, explain yourself. You know, obviously you're not in control of other people's actions, you know, but I think that really what would be fantastic is to see you guys, you know, redouble your efforts, you know, get a watertight, you know, product that's, you know, uh, in the working. Um, and and really get it bootstrapped together and uh, to see a return on this and I think that would be the greatest thing to to come out of this. Yeah, I mean I think Chrisella's idea of doing a hackathon is actually amazing. You know, if we can do a breach CC hackathon where people can create their own model or device, you know, that could be a really 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 cool way to just push out sort of initial ideas in a very experimental type of way and test it with the audience and test it with whoever is engaged in those ideas and, you know, and see how people react to it, right? We have a bit of code that's built up already, you know, but if we could push it out for a public hackathon, that would be fantastic. Well, that's great. Well, look, I just want to, let's finish up the last few minutes of the show um, with some questions. We have a question from David Irvin, um, I presume the David Irvin of MadeSafe. Thank you for being with us, David. Um, he says, I use that a lot, Stephen Pinker uh, piece that I showed. It is true, but there are other opinions such as increased control, so less need to kill, government control leading, apathy, you do not need so many wars to control people. That's okay. So I mentioned this earlier uh, that you should look up something called reactance in psychology. So um, this goes all the way back to Descartes and actually Baudrillard in the late 20th century philosopher talked about simulacra. Okay, this idea that ultimate freedom would be inside of a cocoon and you would be able to execute your desires in a virtual reality. Yes, and that would be absolute freedom and everyone could go around doing whatever they wanted to do, but doesn't that actually sound an awful lot like the matrix? And then how do we know the world is real, etc, etc? Because freedom begins with security. If you can't defend your biology, if you can't defend your body, then you're not really free. So I encourage you to go look up this topic, it's called reactance. Um, you can learn all about it, it's basically about in, um, how to influence other people's decisions. If people don't realize that they're being controlled by all the subtle, you know, the, 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 the flashy buttons that come up and the points, you're going to get points and badges, like no one's going to go to their grave with the fact that they were the mayor of Starbucks on, you know, some check-in app or whatever, right? Yeah. Like these, these are not war medals people but yet you allow yourself to be guided by all these subtle psychological manipulations that are well understood by the market researchers. So what David's saying is actually a very good point, that a lot of this this this, this type of control now is, is rather underhanded and a little bit um, more, you know, I can't, I'm, lo I'm losing my, my words, but you know what I mean. It's, it's a little bit more underhanded and, and behind the scenes and you don't know that it's there. So look up that. Also look up gamification, uh, coding, Conduct.cc. Uh, this guy is just brilliant. So, 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 so uh, I want to share a link as well. You know, yeah, go for it. Yeah. Uh, well, not a link actually, but just uh, Wikipedia. I think. Panarchy. Panarchy. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Go ahead, share it. Uh, well, I don't have the link. Oh, actually. okay. I'll, I'll share. I'll share. Wikipedia. Uh, hold on. There it is. So yeah, take, could you could you describe a little bit about it? Yeah. So um, essentially, I mean, um, hold on. Sorry, let me just get back from the search. Google hang out. Hangout. Uh, give me a second, please. Yeah, sure. Uh, Yeah, so essentially panarchy um, is um, the thought that regardless of what region you live in, uh, you can choose your own terms of law, right? And you can choose your own uh, moral code of law. And this is not something new. This is something that had been practiced for hundreds of years. So um, to give you a practical example of something I experienced myself is when I lived in Afghanistan, 
Um, so there would be a village where everybody would be, you know, some people would be Pashtuns and they would follow the Pashti Wali. And some people would be Uzbek, and some people would be Tajiks, you know, etc. Everybody had their own code of law. And that worked pretty well, you know, as long as that was like a commonly understood um, paradigm. So as long as everybody understood that they had their own local laws and own local courts and, and, and they followed their own local laws, it was okay. But the moment a uh, centralized government came in and tried to make a sort of one solution fits all, and that's when it started to become fragmented and clearly ungovernable. And, and, you know, you, you can't govern it anymore because um, because people were just not used to using like one centralized type of law, and it didn't make sense to them, and it was immoral. So I think monarchy is is it's a very old idea, but it's an idea that's been functional in the society for a very long time, and that have proven more efficient and more peaceful than other ideas. Yeah, that's really great. Um, yeah, so I encourage people to check out um, all these fields of research. We put links in the, the show notes below because one of the, the philosophy of the World Crypto Network is to actually give you the control over the information and not have the information control you. So we like to leave everyone with more learning material than, the, than they came with. We also had a, one last question, I guess, from, from Theo, who was with us earlier, but had to go. Um, oh, it's a technical question, I guess, uh, or an economical question. Um, how does Bit BitNation make money? How much and how often will the div dividends be distributed? Um, why does um, the XBN token have value? Okay, so um, I'll try to answer one of, uh, all of those questions one of the time. So, um, so in terms of dividend payments, uh, we anticipate, based on our economic model, which I can share with you, uh, that we will start to turn a profit about after approximately two years, and then we will redistribute about 10% of that profit, because we also need to keep a lot of profit for further developments, and you know, um, and 10% is is pretty much average in terms of what other public companies share, you know. Um, so um, that's in the sense of, of the equity paid, right? In, in terms of how we will generate money, there are several profit models. I mean, essentially, we have 16 different profit models because we have about 16 different services. <laughs> but to put it shortly, I mean, the greatest money maker is just to take a very small percentage on the platform, um, meaning the uploads and the downloads, right, that are paying money. So if you look at, for instance, the Apple App Store, they charge 30%. We are planning to charge, you know, for their apps, right, the governance, uh, non-governance apps. Well, we're planning to charge about 2% for uploads and downloads uh, if they're paying, you know, if, if they're paying apps for, for government services. So that is one way to make money, which I think is the biggest money maker. But obviously, we will have to test it on the market before we know that for sure. And um, I mean, other money makers are to charge a percentage on contracts made on the platform, which I think is less lucrative and less beneficial because, I mean, we want to make this as grassroots as possible. So if people have to pay a charge for contracts they sign, even though I mean, it has the benefit to sort of prevent civil attacks because it creates a, a, a difficult different for level uh, hacks. It, it still, it still creates a layer of sort of um, that is difficult for some people to join us. So I'm not sure if we're going to pursue with a sort of charge per contract uh, or not. I mean, essentially, we'll have to test it on the market, you know. And, um, and that goes along with ID system. We have to test the ID system for civil attacks and stuff and see what is the best prevention method. And um, yeah, so that's about it. So I mean, we have calculated all of that uh, with concrete measures. Uh, and, and I can share the economic model with you now. 
uh, we're finalizing the business plan now. I was supposed to put it out much earlier, but I've been bogged down in technical issues with counter wallet and media issues, obviously, and like all different sorts of issues. So, but we will have it finished within the next, hopefully, in the next 24 hours, you know, and then the, with with the five years financial projections and all of that, I can already share the five years financial proje projections with you right now. And um, yeah, and then um, I mean there are further, you know, other ways like spin-off products where we can make money as well. So one of them, for instance, are physical IDs, actually printed IDs, um, like in a place like Afghanistan. Uh, people rely because the government is so corrupt and so inefficient. People rely more on corporate IDs and on governmental issued IDs. And if you look at a place like Estonia, it's a private company providing all of the, 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 the ID system and they are selling it and it's accepted widely. Yeah, they can't travel across border, borders with it, but, it, but it's widely accepted when it comes to like internal government institutions and com companies, obviously, you know, it's the de facto ID system. So that's sort of like a spin-off product, if you like. Um, but yeah, so there are very many different ways to make this profitable. Um, but yeah, as I said before, the main way we see this is to take a very small percentage on, uh, of transactions on the platform. I love the idea of doing the physical printed passport. There's this project here that someone made me aware of the other day. It's a private company that issues a world passport, but the number of countries that accept it, as you can see here, are very low. But I just like it for the actual principle of it. And I also like economic models where you're charging for real value because one of the things at the moment um, that I feel like we're going through is, let me see if... Um, Okay, so uh, someone made me aware of this essay, which I'd only really heard of, and it's just one of those things, I, it's on my reading list for ages, but it's an essay called As We May Think, um, and the author, who is, is unknown to me, it's, it's this chap here, he's an engineer, uh, Vannevar Bush, um, he basically laments the, the, the role that, that physics uh, took on in, in, in World War II and with the creation of the atomic bomb and tried to imagine a world where technology was used as a force. But he essentially came up with uh, what would later on become the World Wide Web and, and the Internet and so on. Um, and I was just really inspired to, to learn about this. So this is on my reading list and I encourage other people to read it because really what we're witnessing at the moment is um, the, the transition of our species into this hyper-connected state. And I think that we need to start asking ourselves very hard questions about what we do with the information that we that we see and share in the public and the information that we have access to. One of the interesting things about the future is that it hasn't been witnessed yet. It is therefore unknown. But also witnessed information is also unknown. But it's a different category of information. And I think we really need to examine that. And I think that the blockchain does do that. Now. Um, all that's really left for me to say, of course, is to thanks to all my guests. Of course, we've been dropping like flies and been on air. Tomorrow night, um, UK time, that is, uh, we will be hopefully live streaming Sarah Micklejohn from uh, University College London. Uh, thanks to Ishmael in the London Bitcoin Meetup for inviting us along. She's going to be talking about Bitcoin and anonymity. She has a paper. You should check out her website, which I'll leave in the description below after the show finishes. Um, so we're going to be live with her, and hopefully we'll be able to get the same mic set up like we had with Tom the other day. Um, also, please do send the donations in because they really help pay for our travel and our food expenses. Um, that would be really, really helpful. So what thanks to everyone for joining us. Say again. What is the address for the donations? Oh, the ad the addresses for every person on the channel is in the description below, and also my address yeah, is up there as well. Um, so you can send that in. That would be really cool. It cost me about twenty pounds to travel across London during the day, plus you know a bit of food as well because I cycle and burning those calories. So thank you so much, Suzanne, for coming on and, and having your say because we talked so much about you and <laughs> just feel right unless you were going to be here. And we did throw some hard questions, but you handled them very well. And one thing that reassured me is that you're very humble and you do take criticism very well, which I find even more reassuring because I think that otherwise, I, w I don't know, I wasn't sure what to think. 
but once once I saw the way you handled the questions, I look forward actually now to to kind of helping out and seeing what I can do. It may not be in this guise. It may take some time. We may have to go through some different iterations. But no, I love your ideas. I love your passion, and I really want to thank you for spending time with us this evening. Well, thank you, Chris. I mean, it's sort of rare to see people actually reaching out to me to get information firsthand rather than going on like rumors on blogs, you know, and um, so I really appreciate your efforts to to actually go to the source, you know, and make your opinion of yourself rather than just following rumors, you know, that is something I really do appreciate. Them. So yeah. yeah, so let's figure out this hackathon. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah. Lovely. Well, thanks everyone. You can follow us at World Crypto Net, me at Mr. Chris Ellis, and at MyBitNation on Twitter. See you next time. Bye bye.